Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can all hear me. <clears throat> so, um, thank you very much for attending uh, this webcast. Uh, this is about uh, restoring trust after a breach. Um, a quick introduction to myself and then we'll, we'll crack on. Uh, any questions you have, there is a questions uh, button you can press. Feel free to ask questions along the way, but what I'll do is I'll wait until the end before I actually answer all of those. So, first off, um, my name is Joel Barnes. I'm uh, one of the senior, senior systems engineers here at Tripwire. Um, I've been working with some of the largest strategic accounts that Tripwire have in Europe. Uh, for the last four years, helping them to you know, secure and get their environments into a good state. Uh, prior to uh, Tripwire, I spent four years at Symantec, and then uh, prior to that, about three years at a company called Bindview. So I've been working in the information security uh, arena for quite a long time now, uh, and there's a fair amount of experience that I have, um, and also a lot of experience that Tripwire has with addressing um, breaches and how to get control of the environment again. So this webcast is all about um, how do a breach has taken place, what do you do? What is the methodology behind how you gain uh, a level of trust in what you own? Um, and ultimately, um, it's to make your environment more defensible because you know, the last thing you want if you've had a breach is to have another breach. Uh, yes, you'll have experience of the first one. That's no good as far as everybody else is concerned. So... Let's just crack on through here. So, the first thing really is that when a breach takes place, um, it doesn't happen at a nice time. Uh, it doesn't happen when you expect it to. It always is going to blindside you. So, what happens is that when we're going in and speaking to clients who've had a breach, there's lots and lots of questions that, that come up. Uh, typically, such things as, uh, what happened? Um, wh what was actually done to compromise my systems or the data in them? You know, is it a confidentiality issue? Is it an availability issue? Is it an integrity issue? What's the extent of the damage? Is it uh, just one system? Is it multiple systems? Is it brand? Is it data? Is it uh, service? It could be any number of different things. Which systems can I actually trust? So if I'm going to continue to run a, my business, can I trust any systems that are actually currently running in my environment? Or do I need to rip them all down and start again? There's issues here we need to address. Um, how can I quickly, how quickly can I figure out where I stand? I don't want to be working on this in three weeks' time. I need to be working on getting ourselves up and running and getting the business working again as fast as possible. And then the fun bit at the end is um, how do I keep this from happening again? Um, as I said before, you don't, you know, the last thing you want to do is fix something, leave something bad within the environment so you can get compromised again. Or there's something sleeping in there that then just reactivates and again, you're done again. Now, this is a, essentially a process that we have to go through. Um, if that process is defined prior to um, any event taking place, then this is gonna, only going to help streamline uh, what I'm going to go through in the next few stages. So when these things actually take place, then ultimately you need to go out and you need to, you know, you've been breached, you need to go and you need to look at your environment. So there's stuff here. So you need to go out and look at your server estate and your network estate and all the databases and all the users and all of the things in there. And ultimately there's a huge amount of these things. And you need to find what has, what is the odd one out within there or the odd two out or the odd three out or whatever. But you need to compare those. So ultimately, you've got this sort of very high level. I've got you know, hundreds or thousands of assets that I need to assess. Some of those are going to be bad. So that's fine. You may be able to find those. But it doesn't stop there, unfortunately. Because what then tends to happen is, as you zoom in to these various different individual components, maybe it's the line of service that stopped working properly, you get even more detail. So you need to know you know, what systems are involved, whether they're good, whether they're bad, what accounts might be involved, all number of different things. And ultimately, when you get down to this level, the idea of actually manually assessing or using direct observation on these things becomes very, very difficult to uh, maintain, just because of the sheer volume of data, the sheer volume of devices, and the sheer volume of settings on those devices, any number of different things. So what we need to do is we need to be able to create this process by, so that we can ascertain what the issues are within the environment and then be able to 
spend time analyzing that data to be able to get your systems back into a trusted state. You don't want to be spending all of your time trying to find out what's actually in the environment. That's hopefully something that you already know. So if we sort of skip on, there's a, a bunch of steps um, that we're going to go through here. Um, there's about eight of them, but they've been combined and, and moved around to make the flow of this uh, webcast a little better. So I'll go through these. Uh, and apologies for the first one. There's a Z in there that I managed to not remove from the slides I received. So what we need to do is um, get all of these things. The first thing you need to do is look at uh, stabilizing the patient. So the, the idea of this is like, you know, something that come into the you know, A and E, we need to, the first thing we need to do is make sure that it's not going to just die. So how do we get to the point whereby we know what's happening, we can address it? We don't want to be you know, running around with our hair on fire trying to fix everything because that doesn't actually stabilize the patient. You need to know what you've got first. Doing lots and lots of things really, really fast may help to a certain extent, but ultimately it's probably going to be detrimental to the cause. Uh, know what you have and prioritize by risk and value. If you've been breached or compromised or whatever, you cannot do everything immediately. Um, there's not enough time, not enough money, all those things. So there's a prioritization process that needs to go through about what is the largest risk to the business and what's the highest value assets in there? How do we go in about addressing those? Because they're the things we need to address first. Just like when you start thinking about business continuity or disaster recovery, these are exactly the same sorts of uh, thought processes that need to go in around breach um, assessment. Um, define what good looks like. This is something that's you know, never really or often overlooked. Do you actually have a definition of what it should look like? If you don't have a definition of what it should look like, how do you know what's wrong? It's kind of like having a standard server bill but not actually applying it. You just don't know what state anything is in. Once you define what the, this known good is, you need to actually get information off your systems. So harvest all the system state uh, information from the production systems, because the production that we need to essentially fix here, right? Um, and then start looking at uh, reference node variance analysis. So lots of big words, but ultimately it's comparing what we got from our production systems to what we know as good, and find out what those differences are. Because that way you can actually you know, start seeing which bits of the environment you need to either rip out, you need to fix, whatever. Um, which is the second point, uh, the penultimate point there. Remove the suspect systems from the environment and return to a trustworthy state. You know, that's where we want to be ultimately. And the final point is kind of after the event, which is continuously mon monitor what you've done and where your systems are now and validate that that's correct because you don't want to be re-compromised. That's like the worst case scenario here. And a lot of these things, although we're, you know, this presentation is approaching it after a breach, actually what we, a lot of these processes that we've got here can be performed prior to a breach. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of comment on those as we go through, which will help, you know, make you more defensible, which is ultimately where we're at. So let's have a quick look at um, the next slide, which is about stabilizing the patient. So a breach has taken place. Someone has informed you or the business or whoever within the environment that something has happened. The first thing you need to do is address what you have. You need to stabilize everything and get control as of the situation at the very least. One of the key, the, the two key things, the, actually the, the stuff on this slide is multiple bullets, but actually the, the sub-headline here, which is reduce the opportunity for further compromise and confusion. That's the key piece here. Now, stabilizing the patient um, is all about, is based on the visible ops framework, which is certainly something that I would recommend everyone read if you haven't had a chance to do so. But the idea is to get to the point where the environment is predictable and it is stable. It may still be compromised, but at least you know how compromised it is and you can do something about it. So one of the first things you need to do is remove or reduce any access to production. So you want to make sure that people are not going in and doing anything else. Because if they're doing other things, then it could either exacerbate the problem or it could create extra noise that you need to filter out when you're doing your analysis. So try and lock it down as fast as possible. Um, also, if you can't obviously reduce access, remove access fully, which you can't, 
you need to reduce it because the last thing you want is multiple stakeholders going in and doing what they think is best. There needs to be a coordinated effort. So if you've only got one set of access points into the environment, that's you know, credentials and all sorts of other things, then only that person can do it and then you know what they're doing. And that's the key thing here, it's knowing what's going on. Um, standard stuff here, change all production credentials. You need to, you know, you should be doing this anyway, um, and there should be a process behind how you do this. Um, you know, there's policies about why you do it. Do it again. Make sure you're doing this, because if someone's compromised your credentials, you need to get them off those credentials. Three changes, um, except with very deliberate management review and scrutiny. Um, this is about making sure that you know, if something now changes, having had introduced a change freeze, you know that it's probably something that's either system-led or it's something that the person who's compromised your systems is implementing, at which point it gives you information you can then act upon. Yes, there are things that you need to do that are emergency stuff, like you know, if, it's, you know, if someone's performance compromised due to the fact you haven't patched something, which will essentially, if you, you know, open everything up again, will immediately re-compromise, then yes, you need to do that. But you need to make sure that it's under scrutiny about what's going on there. Um, business as usual change, just the general sort of stuff, churn that's going through. Try and kill that for the initial point because that creates noise. And you don't want to have to filter out that noise initially, in, I say, unless it's urgent. There are risks you need to ascertain. Again, all of these things need to be put on a risk framework. Um, and don't forget about your third parties as well. If you're in an outsourced environment, you've got contractors, they're all vectors for attack, they're all vectors for compromise, they're all points of, potential points of weakness. So if you are looking at third parties, um, you need to start locking those guys down as well. And you need to communicate with them, which I'll talk about later on, but ultimately communication and is, can be very key, but you need to be careful about how you do it. So knowing what you have, um, you can't do everything at once here. You can't just you know, black the entire environment away and re-initialize uh, it. Um, you need to set priorities about what you need to do. So the first thing you need to do really is, once you, is inventory the environment. Find out what you own. Where is it? What's it sitting? What line of service is it running? What software is running on it? What, level of, what type of data sits on it? Any number of different bits of information about what the environment looks like it's only going to be helpful because that allows you to prioritize where you drive your work to fix the problems. And this sort of thing, this inventory of the environment, this is something that you can do way in advance and you should be doing way in advance of any breach. Um, you know, the SANS top 20 um, critical security controls, the first four of those, the first two of those, sorry, are what do you own and what's installed on it. This is essentially that point. If you've done that already, you're already one step ahead of everything here. And it's pretty, you know, foundational stuff that you need to do here. There are bits of software uh, out there that can help you to um, address this sort of thing. You know, various different network scanners, there's freeware stuff like Nmap, there's, you know, Tripwire obviously provide IP360. These all have a level of discovery in there to find out exactly what is out there. Once you've done that, um, you need to determine what's most important and document the criteria about why it's most important. And this is where comes, stuff comes in. And the last point on this slide, which I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail in a minute, is all about um, what IT thinks is the most important and what the business thinks is the most important are not necessarily the same things. So there is a communication that needs to take place about what is actually critical to the business. So there's a, an idea behind this sort of fragile artifacts that you need to look at. And these are things that have, you know, the highest business, business impairment cost. You know, it could be, you know, your payment transaction point. So you cannot process anything. So you're essentially losing money all the time. Or it could be a supply chain issue at the back end, so you can't deliver anything or get anything out the door. They're going to have different levels of impact. Um, it could be stuff that's make or break. You know, if someone takes down the entire customer database, you can do nothing. So that will obviously have a very, very high uh, level of risk in there. Anything, honestly, that has big consequences. So delivering that um, inventory of those key things gives you your first point of call. But that's not actually enough. You need to start looking at um, 
the, the next sort of layer out there, things that interact with those fragile systems. Because often the fragile systems can be the ones that are um, very well protected. And actually, it's the stuff that's around it that's interfacing with it where the compromise takes place. Now, you could go to the nth degree on this, but there's time and there's money and there's resource. So think about where is most critical for you to get to. Um, assess your data sources. So this is all about um, logging. This is about forensics. This is about evidence. Um, ensure they are protected. That's one of the key things here. If your data sources have been compromised, you are going to have a very poor view of what is going in here. So this is all stuff around centralizing your logging, making sure that you're putting them onto um, offline storage so people they can't be compromised. You're encrypting them. You're making them available only to uh, si single systems so that other people can't do things. But you also need to look at the data sources as they're being um, as, uh, created. So has anybody disabled logging on any systems? Um, are they changing the permissions of the logs? Are they suddenly, you know, open to everyone? Um, are people starting removing lines out of them? Are they getting smaller rather than just being cleared down? Are they not getting any bigger anymore? You know, all these different things you just need to assess and then be able to see where it's taking place. And then ultimately, stay on the same page as the business management. Business management is critical to this because that's who we all work for. And if the business goes under, we lose our jobs. So we need to make sure that they are kept informed and they have a say somewhere. So a lot of things, I say, we, when we talk later about some of the um, communication things, there's cross-functional teams that need to be put in place in here uh, or a task force or something, whereby there is you know, regular communication about what is happening so that people can make a decision about how best to address these various things. So once we know what we've got, we can then sort of define what good looks like. Now, again, a lot of you know, the inventory stuff, you can do that now. You don't have to wait for the breach. In fact, please don't. Um, but also defining what good looks like is exactly the same. Um, you can define what good looks like um, very easily. It's establishing a trusted reference point. Now, there's lots and lots of ways that you can do this. This is just a, a bullet list of things in here. I'll just pick out a few of them. Um, provisioning sources. So how are you provisioning stuff, looking at all your templates, all that sort of stuff. Now, there is a caveat to provisioning sources that I'll talk about later. You just need to be a little bit careful. But ultimately, what you want to do is you want to create systems or know of systems that are absolutely, this is what I know is my trusted state. You can look at you know, system and application templates, configuration standards. This is, the configuration standard stuff is something that everyone kind of does, but there are issues around how it is performed ultimately. So if you look at the configuration standards, you're looking at things like Center for Internet Security benchmarks. You're looking at the Microsoft frameworks. So that Oracle do hardening guidelines. Red Hat do as well. You know, it's, it's getting guidelines in place that you can then apply to your systems internally. You'll probably want to tweak them, all that sort of thing so that you know what it looks like. And it could just be a paper document sitting in a file that says these are the settings we set. It could be something sitting elsewhere. It could be something documented. It could be something in how you actually deploy these things. It could be something using you know, Microsoft tools or whatever. Other things that can define what, what good is, if you have a good pre-prod or test systems or staging um, that is not part of production or not linked to. So if you've got testing systems, it should be a replication or a very similar to production, but they, it shouldn't have been compromised. But you've got to include lots and lots of things here. Don't just think servers. You've got to think of network devices, databases, accounts. This is all quite tedious. There's lots and lots of stuff here, but the more information you get out of this, the better it's going to be. Uh, VM libraries. They're very cool. Uh, defensive software libraries, deployment packages. Um, look at redundant data centers. Note, the key thing here with redundant data centers is actually not data center, it's redundant. Because you know, if you've got a uh, hot, data, uh, hot standby over there, there's replication. So if you've got a compromise in your production environment and it's replicated to your uh, backup data center, then essentially you've got two you know, things that are problematic. If you've got mirroring solutions and stuff like that. So look at redundant ones and cold standbys and things like that that allow you to essentially go and view what things should look like prior to the breach. Um, backups, obviously. Um, so you can restore from backups, but again, look at when, 
the breach had taken place and when the backup took place. So if you're going to restore a system from backup to use it as a reference, make sure that you're absolutely convinced that that backup was taken before the breach took place. Otherwise, you're just restoring the breach, which is just be daft. Um, worst case scenario, build it by hand. That's going to be incredibly expensive. But ultimately, that's what we need to do. So once we've got a sort of reference system, essentially, then we need to go out into production. And you need to go and gather data off your endpoints. And we essentially need to assess the current state of those systems. So if we look at um, how you can do this, there's multiple ways of doing it. There's multiple vendors out there. Obviously, uh, Tripwire can do agent, agentless uh, inspection. But you need to go and decide what you're gonna, how you're going to do this. Now, typically, you'll have something in place already. So it's a matter of making sure that you know, people are aware of how to use the tools, things are automated as much as possible, um, and go and gather that data as fast as possible. But you need to start thinking about exactly what you're going to gather from here. So you need to look at you know, the OS side of things, obviously, because that's often where the compromise takes place. But it's not only. Applications are, are very vulnerable as well. Um, you need to look at settings. So, you know, just because something's configured, sorry, an OS is configured correctly, there are often settings that are not part of the configuration. They may be changed by something else. So get those configs off. Um, user information. I haven't touched on users uh, particularly strongly uh, so far, but they're critical. Um, making sure that, you know, only the exact people have the rights on systems, whether they're admin access, whether they're local access, whatever, absolutely vital. Look at file hashes. There's lots of things that will look right in inverted commas, but aren't. You know, people are often dumping um, uh, exe files or um, binary files on systems that masquerade as something else. So they'll perform the same function, but they'll do something else as well. So that, you know, if you look at a Linux box or, you know, if someone goes and hijacks ls, you know, it's going to ex someone's going to run that command at some point, probably as root. They're going to get hold of that. So you need to know the hashes are there. Similarly, you don't know what's going to happen in something like an alternative data stream. So if someone's, you know, the file will look exactly the same. And actually the file size will be exhibited by Windows exactly the same if an alternative data stream has been compromised. But the hash will be different. So take a look at all these different things. And then move all of that to a discrete storage location, somewhere away from production. Because you don't want someone else being able to see, you know, or the, whoever's in there, to be able to see what you're doing. It also um, has got a lot of stuff around tampering, and then there's um, uh, regulation, and you know, if law enforcement need to go, come in, and chain of custody, and there's so lots and lots of things here that are back thing. Which is why, when we start talking about communication, we start talking about other areas of the business, like legal and things like that, who need to be kept informed about why you're doing all of this. So we've got, the more data you get, the more likely you are to be successful, but you can't do it by hand. You need to start getting these things um, automated. Because the more data you have, of course, of course, the more difficult it is to sift by hand. But if you can automate all these things, then you're going to get um, a lot more value out of, work, uh, of the data that you have. So now, it, now it's the inverted commas easy bit. Um, compare what you ha have to what you should have. So you've built your reference systems. You've got all the data off your production environment. Now you need to find out what's different. So it's the, it's the old game that we used to do when we were kids. Spot the difference. But it's a spot the difference on a colossal scale. But the key thing is here is that when you spot differences, it needs to be assessed based on the risk to the environment. So it's not just spot every dis difference. If you spot every difference, you're going to be there for months. It's spot every difference, but then assign a level of business criticality and risk to it, as we did right at the beginning when we were looking at the inventory. So we've inventoried our environment. We know where the critical assets are. So we're going to essentially go out and start looking for all those differences. The difficult thing lies in the it's not just system state that you need to look at, because the state is, is, should be fairly static, but there's all sorts of other bits of information that can come in here. 
So you're going to want to take all their system state information and correlate it alongside other bits of information. So you're going to look at, you know, ongoing event logs. You might want to look at flow data. You may want to look at uh, network topology stuff to see if things are starting to communicate with systems that they shouldn't. So, it, you know, the system may not look like it's being compromised, but suddenly it's communicating with a database it shouldn't be. That sort of thing allows you to start getting a far more uh, insightful view of what's going on here. And there's lots of, there's lots of different bits of technology that can help with this. You know, there's big data, there's sims, there's all these other sorts of things that you can start look at to try and cross-correlate all these bits of data. And in this particular component, automation is your friend. I've talked about it previously, but in this bit, being able to do this by manual inspection or something like that, it's just not going to work. You're not going to get there um, in any conceivable, conceivably useful time frame, unless you've got two systems. Most people who are, I imagine who are viewing this probably haven't. So getting this done with you know, as much automation as possible allows you to address issues like you see here. So this is you know, an example of some system state stuff. Um, on the left, we've got what it should look like. On the right, we've got what it, may, um, what it actually does look like. So being able to sort of manually go in and look at all of this stuff is not going to be a possibility. However, if we go and look at this, there are changes in here, but they're going to be, uh, have different levels of priority. So for example, we can see um, the high priority stuff is going to be things that are, we need to address very, very quickly. So there's new unrecognized binaries added to a system. Yeah, that's something that you really don't expect. However, if you haven't closed down your change process, this could be something that was put on for other reasons. Hence the fact that you need to you know, get back to making sure that everything's under control. Hash and access privileges changed on a critical file. So someone's gone and changed LS and changed the access to it and then changed the hash of it as well. So now it's running something else as well. Or we've got you know, something that they're hiding in an alternative data stream which can't be seen by the OS directly. That sort of thing, absolutely critical. New listening ports. You know, it's not just servers, it's network devices as well that we need to look at. And all the logs off those. It could be an outbound connection um, that you need to look at. A new service has been activated. Maybe you've got a, uh, an application where you've disabled a particular service as part of that application due to vulnerabilities, but it's suddenly started up again. So it's part of the application that is perfectly valid, but now you've got the service running, which is notoriously vulnerable for whatever reason. Oh, logging's disabled. As soon as logging starts getting disabled anywhere in the environment, it tends to be a high priority about why. So, you know, these are things that you can then focus on. They drive you towards the assets that are most at risk and that are most likely to be a cause for concern and things you need to fix. Whereas for some of the other things, like new routes added on a border router or new local admin user account, yes, they're an issue, but are they as big an issue as the other stuff? Um, and then the low priorities, non-admin users added. Password policy varies from our corporate policy. You know, things like that, they're, they're things that you should be addressing, but they're not going to be the criticalities that you need to go on here. So once we've found all of these things, what do we actually do? Because that's where we need to get to. We need to be able to essentially get the bad apples out of the barrel. We need to remove the suspicious or no malicious assets from your network because, you know, they're still compromised, right? You know, despite all of this data gathering and, you know, configuring all of these things that we've got, we now know what's, or hopefully we know what are bad systems. But there is a big, there's a big challenge here. And that is that a lot of the time you cannot remove them because they're performing a function. And that is absolutely critical. So you, before you can remove them, you need to be able to have created a new system to be able to essentially replace it. So sometimes you have to, you know, kind of just do triage on that system and kind of get um, far more aggressive on that system and get it down so it's only doing exactly what you expect to do despite the fact it's compromised. And this takes us back to when we were talking right at the beginning about stabilizing the, that patient. Previously, we were looking at it on a you know, environment-wide basis um, and trying to get it into a known and predictable state. 
Now we're looking at it on a system level basis. So we need to essentially get that system into a known predictable set that is not going to do anything else. So we know that it's doing something. We can then maybe put mitigating controls around it whilst it continues to do other things. Um, again, you know, what's that um, stabilizing? Reducing access to those systems. So start looking at you know, all the local accounts, all that sort of stuff, and get rid of those. So you, or reduce them, lock them down. So you've got more control over that device. You might want to put, you know, monitor that one more closely. Actually put a pair of eyeballs on the logs of that one specific system because they may be able to see something before it gets correlated within other places. So it gives you that opportunity to um, get right into the detail of what's um, happening on the compromised systems. Don't be too quick in blowing stuff away. Because blowing stuff away removes a whole bunch of information that you could use for after the event stuff. Um, you want to quarantine, you want to you know, get these things out, you may want to take um, replication, you may want to take copies. For further analysis, find out how after the event. You know, fix everything, then find out how it happened so you can make sure it doesn't happen again. If you just, you know, oh my word, this system is uh, compromised, quick, blow it away and build it again then you've lost everything. You're just basically replacing it with something that was compromised before and now you've got a clean one that can be compromised again. That doesn't actually really help. Um, it might help in the very short term, but it doesn't give you any long-term gains. Um, I've already um, talked about uh, point three there, which is if you must keep a compromised system running, uh, implement controls to prevent it from infecting other systems. Start giving it static routing across the environment. Make sure it can only communicate with very specific systems. Shut down anything on that system that's not absolutely vital. Remove at network access, remove user access, all of these things that you need to do. Um, and try and um, look at uh, the infection vector. So if you, now that you can hopefully see where it's been compromised and what they're doing, you should be able to get some sort of insight into where that took place. Look at the logs. If you can see a particular type of behavior on a compromised system, is that behavior happening elsewhere? It may not be something that is you know, within your SIM correlation rules. It may be something that's very uh, focused against you. Have a look, see what behavior is taking place, and then see if you can see that elsewhere. Because that way you can actually start, it will actually help drive you to other systems that you may not have known were compromised as well. This is the bit that can be very, very tedious. Because you need to look at a lot of detail to get to exactly what you need to do here. Automation can help, again, um, but a lot of that is working quite specifically on large amounts of systems. So this is where you're actually going into the individual system, and this is where expertise can very much help. And a lot of people start implementing, th getting third parties in to help with this if you don't have the resources available. I'll talk a little bit about that as we go uh, on. So we've done all of this. We now found where all these systems are, and we can start removing them from our environment. The next point, of course, is the final point where we want to get to, which is redeploy trustworthy systems. We want to get the trustworthy systems in here. Um, get the bad ones out, put the good ones in, but don't put the good ones in as they were before the breach took place. That's not a good idea because they got breached in that, in that state. So you want to make sure they're going in in a more secure state than, what, than when they were breached. So you want to recreate systems from trusted sources. This is absolutely vital. And you need to assess the trusted sources you have to see how trusted they actually are. So if you're restoring from backup, make sure the backup took place and what was in the backup didn't have a breach component in it. Was the breach backed up? Or was the compromise backed up? Look at your deployment mechanisms. Um, so things like patching and things like that. Have your patching mechanisms been compromised? those breaches these days that are actually, you know, allowing people to compromise uh, systems management systems. So, for example, you know, if we look at, say, Microsoft patching, if Microsoft don't hash their patches. So if someone were to get a dodgy patch within uh, an, a patch mechanism, then that patch will be deployed to all your systems. If you're going to use that mechanism for once you've built all your systems to patch, that is a you know, a vector of attack that is very powerful in the hands of someone uh, you don't want in your environment. 
So be aware of these things. It's not just looking at doing the same thing again. It's the old you know, definition of madness. You know, if you keep doing the same thing and expect something different, um, that, you, it's madness. So look at where you are, look at what you, where things should be, look at how you're deploying them and build it based on a good standard. Make sure you've got your security patches up to date uh, and harden all your systems. Look at your baselines that you're going to implement. So, you know, let's, let's pretend that all your deployment mechanisms are trusted and all that sort of stuff. How are you going to define your systems um, and, and push them out? So we already talked about what, you know, what good is and we were talking about, you know, looking at Center for Internet Security benchmarks and things like that for actually how you configure your systems. This is where you need to do that. If you haven't done it already, this is where you need to do it because by pushing secure systems back into the environment, you're far less likely to be compromised again. There are lots of them out there. Lots of people use very different ones um, and they're all tailored to meet you know, specific uh, customer requirements. They are vital, in my opinion, um, for anything regardless of whether it's a server, a database, user accounts, all these other things, there is best practice out there. If you're not doing it, uh, then a breach will, may take place, at which point you will do it. However, a lot of the time, you can do all of this stuff prior to a breach. The problem is, is that <laughs> getting the money and the resource to do it is often a lot easier after a breach um, because you know, things are top of the business's mind rather than looking at just pure availability or throughput of transactions and things like that. Um, once you actually get the good stuff, you know, these new trustworthy, so you're replacing these bad systems with these good systems, um, take a look at whether the changes in the security baselines and the configurations and things like that that you're deploying onto these new systems can be replicated elsewhere. Because this way you'll get a more secure environment. It also, if you've got the processes available to do all of these things, then it, it's comparatively easy, in inverted commas, to do it. You're also in a very strict change control process, so you can essentially make sure that it fits within there and has a lot of oversight in, over it. So there are opportunities here to actually enhance the environment beyond just fixing an initial problem. So we've now got, let's pretend we've now got our trustworthy systems back in place. We, we are, you know, we, we've gone through all this process, we're now back to where we need to be. So what do we do now? Well, what we do now is we look at um, the continuous monitoring. So now that you've got everything in place, now you start wanting to look at making sure that you can see any outliers as they take place going forwards. It's, you've got everything in place to essentially get this done. You've got a known good state. You've got a definition of that. You now know what your systems are. You've got lots of evidence of what happened. You can now use all that information to ongoing look at the changes as they take place on the system. So as you go through deploying and repairing all these systems, put a continuous monitoring strategy in place. And there's multiple different ways you can do that. So looking at logs and archiving logs and, and all that sort of stuff is one way of doing it. But there's also looking at change control and you know, configuration standards and how you deploy those. There's lots of different things in there. And again, we come back to anchor to a known trusted standard. The nice thing about these, of course, is you can uh, use them. There's lots of industry expertise going into them. And they change. And that industry expertise continues within there. So have a look around, see which ones fit, you know, and start implementing those. Remember, this is a security issue, not a compliance issue at this point. So a trusted standard like PCI, for example, doesn't guarantee you a level of security. It, may, it will help, but it won't give you a guaranteed level of security. Nothing does, but it will give you far less of a guarantee than a standard like CIS, for example. And what it does if you start pushing this continuous monitoring piece is it, it gives you benefits in security and availability. You see any variances to your systems early. That allows you to take action early. Um, and it allows you to start isolating things before any loss takes place. So if you're waiting three months before you see something, that's not a good thing. If you start looking at things like, uh, I think it's the Verizon uh, data breach report, the average you know, um, time between breach and detection of breach is like, it's in the weeks and months. It's not in the hours, uh, minutes and hours. 
And if you've got someone on your systems for months, they're going to be doing stuff. So if you can see that earlier, that's only going to be better. Uh, understand patterns. We've already started look, looking at that in some of the, um, where we started looking at getting things back into a trusted state and look, you know, defining all of these different things. Um, shorten the time to detection um, and diagnose efficiently and effectively. That's sort of one of the key things here is that if you know what your environment looks like and you can see the changes as they take place, the efficiency of actually fixing things becomes, goes up almost exponentially because those things are no longer big things. They're little things because they happen little and often. You don't get the big bang approach of um, you know, suddenly I've got six months worth of data I need to suddenly look at. It's just things as they go through. So just as an example of where people tend to, you know, the way people tend to work, is there is a periodic approach for monitoring. So they'll have the, you know, audit log and syslogging and all those sorts of fun things to go and get bits of data and review them um, as they take place. But if you start looking at actual system state, it tends to be very periodic. So what will happen is there'll be, you know, a monthly audit or a quarterly audit, at which point, you know, everything, everyone runs around with their hair on fire, goes and gets a whole bunch of information off, usually a subset of systems rather than all systems, and they come back with a big phone book worth of things that need fixing. And then they might get fixed, at which point, you know, you get up to a compliant state, and then you wait another three months. And within that time frame, risk is being introduced into the environment because ch changes are taking place, they're not being seen. And then, you know, it all drops off and then suddenly you run around with your hair on fire again and do the same again. So what tends to happen is we tend to see clients who are, they are doing assessments, but they're either only sampling the environment or they're only doing it very infrequently. Whereas actually what you really need to be doing is the entire environment all the time. But if you try and do that in a periodic approach, you just get swamped with data every six months. And it becomes expensive, and it, there's very little value in it. So if you start looking at the continuous approach, the way you do it is you start with the you know, systems in a bad state, you get them to a good state, and then you monitor for change and, on a continuous level. So is, this, is the system changing? Are the users changing? Are the audit logs changing? What's happening? And as those things, as you see those things, you then make it, you, you know, go and address them. What that does is it allows you to maintain a level far higher. And actually what it does is, if you do this well and you automate it, it actually reduces the workload on the staff. And again, once you've done that, this can all be done. You don't need a breach to do any of this. So this is just good practice a lot of the time. So reducing the risk, providing more stable systems because you know about them more of the time. So, once you've come out of this breach, you can then see things as they happen. Now, like any good relationship in the world, communication is key. So, you need to be visible, you need to be consistent, and you need to be credible. So, as IT professionals, we need to communicate internally and we need to communicate externally. Keep business management a price of your pro progress. They're going to be running around with their hair on fire as well. Um, because they're going to have to deal with a whole bunch of problems that are taking place. We need to essentially keep them appraised of what we are doing, how often we're doing it, what the time you know, to fix is likely to be, what the impact is, what possible workarounds there are, all sorts of other things. Set milestones and targets based on agreed priorities, and that's agreement is the key thing. So we've had customers who look at, you know, setting up a crisis room or a crisis conference call bridge, things like that, that allow you to, you know, every hour, or every two hours, everyone hops onto a conference call and gives an update on where they are. Now, there are multiple stakeholders within this. It's not just IT. There could be legal, there could be uh, risk, there could be the business leaders, there could be the CE. Oh, there could be the CFO. There could be any number of team, people on this, all of whom have got things to do. So if we look at those targets that are being set, once you set them, you need to meet them. So you need to set them realistically as you go through. And if you're setting targets, communicating them and meeting them, people think you're credible. If you're saying, I'll fix this in an hour and you know it's going to take three, don't do that. Communication is key. It's kind of the old thing, you know, no news is not necessarily good news. No news is just no news. Um, 
if, you, if something bad is happening, you want to know about it so you can do things about it and you can mitigate it. Uh, and probably the biggest difficulty, communicate in language they understand. So telling um, someone who runs a line of business about a rootkit on a Linux box and how it works is not going to help them. Telling them that you know, they're going to only be able to process half the number of transactions they were processing, that's something that they can then essentially deal with. They won't like it, but they can deal it, with it. Be very careful. This is probably the most difficult thing that IT generally are, ha are finding most difficult, is how to create you know, a... A, a line of communication into business leaders that they understand, so they know what the value of IT security is. If you start talking and techie, what tends to happen is your credibility tends to drop. You look like you're blustering, it looks like you're trying to obfuscate the issues and make them, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can, it's, that's not a good way of doing it. Openness, communication, absolutely key. There are also external communications that need to take place. Um, legal. If there's any legal disclosures you have, you need to start looking at how best to make sure that you're you know, archiving all the evidence, whether there's issues around who you need to notify, all of that sort of stuff. PR. What's the um, impact to your um, uh, reputation in the industry? Things like that. Um, they're going to be absolutely key. Inform and involve key customers and stakeholders early. If you tell your customers or whoever they are that this has happened, you're going to do, you know, it has happened. Telling them that it's happened and what you're doing about it and timelines and all those sorts of things will help. If they get told by a third party that you have been breached, that will not help. You will not come away from that a very happy person. Keep up the pulse of comms. Don't just, you know, drop an email or drop a blog post and say, right, we're doing stuff. Because if you do that, people go, great, what are you doing? And you say, well, we're doing this, that. And you go silent for like a day. People want to know. Even if that update is nothing's happened, we haven't found anything, we are continuing to work on it, that helps. It keeps people in the loop. People feel better about it. Um, and like everything I've said before, a lot of this can be done before the event. Create a communication and response plan before you need one. Now, um, I, I, the, there's another point in here where I'm putting my tinfoil paranoia hat on. Be aware that internal comms may have been compromised as part of that breach. So, you know, don't overdo this, but if someone's, you know, got root level access to a bunch of systems, they, will be monitor they could be monitoring what you are doing. You don't want to be sending an email out saying, hey guys, I'm going to take this system down and you know, put this bit of software on this thing and I'm going to shut this port down if they can see that because they'll just reroute and, and do sorts of other things. So you're not going to help yourself. There are other ways of doing it. You, know, um, you don't want to let anyone, know, anyone bad know what you're doing. A lot of that is around you know, looking at what actually happened during the breach. Is it just a data exfiltration thing? Is it a full compromise of root level access everywhere? You know, there's lots of different ways of viewing this. But you can start looking at, you know, rather than sending an email, send an SMS uh, or a text message. If you've got a conference call bridge, don't you know, send it over email again because if you send over email, then you know, someone can get on there. Make sure everyone identifies themselves when they come on. You know, all that sort of thing. Or put extra security in there, like a passcode that's then sent by text. You know, things like that that you can do. Working on things like hard copies, it's really old-fashioned. But actually, if you've got a response plan and a flow diagram and all sorts of other things for a cert team, and you've got a process documented with various different flows, and everyone carries one around with them for exactly this thing, this is what we do at Tripwire, all of our key stakeholders within our security incident response team have you know, a piece of paper that they carry around with them all the time that says who they need to call, who they need to contact, how they need to do it, if anything were to take place. That way they don't have to look at it elsewhere and it's not stored anywhere. But they all know it. They all have it. Um, and obviously, if you can get face-to-face, -face, that's far better as well. Um, but, you know, let's not overemphasize that. It's, it's a nice sort of logical thing, but just be aware, you know, the way these things are moving, you know, there are back channels in here that people can use to either go around you, blindside you, or just find out what you're doing.
So we're sort of closing this down now. Um, we've kind of gone through all these things. A lot of the stages that I spoke about, they can happen at the, some of them can happen in parallel. Um, you know, defining a known good state whilst investigating what's happening outside in the production environment, they can sort of happen at the same time. Communication needs to happen throughout. There are lots of things that we need to do. Um, when you're measuring and communicating, um, all this stuff that we've been doing, all this data we've been analysing and getting information out of, it needs to be communicated up to someone to make a decision. Um, action needs to take place. And people need to make decisions, and those different, and different people will need to make those different decisions. So, be aware, if you're communicating certainly upwards into the management chain, into CFO, things like that. Um, so, for example, in Tripwire, our CFO is in charge of our risk, and that's IT risk as well. He has no IT knowledge whatsoever, but he's responsible for that. So he needs to understand what the IT risk is. We can't give him lots of bits and bytes and operating systems and things like that. That's not how it works. He needs things that you need to, you know, keep it really simple. Um, small amounts of numbers. Don't give them multiple sets of numbers. You know, a number or two numbers. Up arrows, down arrows, primary colours, you know, red, green, they're not primary I know, but um, red and green uh, or amber, you know, these things are understood. So, if, you know, if you know, at the beginning of the breach everything's red and you've got priority levels on them of one, two, three and four, that's probably stuff that someone will understand. If those red things start going to amber and then to green, that's good. You don't need to know how it happened, you know, what was required, but that's fairly useful. And make it relevant. So those priority levels need to come from not only IT, but business stakeholders as well. So, with that in mind, um, don't be afraid to ask for help. We've got experience, um, there are other third parties out there who've got experience of dealing with all of these different things. Start looking at external PR agencies who can help with things. Start looking at forensic teams. You know, if you don't have the experience, don't be afraid to use third parties in there. Um, Please do keep in touch. Um, if you've got any questions about this, you can email me directly. Um, my email address is there. Um, the State of Security blog um, up on the Tripwire website is an excellent resource with lots of very useful things about security in general. Um, then we also have a high performer at tripwire.com address, which, is, which goes out to some of our, our very key people who are addressing exactly these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you email through to that, you can expect to get a response from some of the guys who really know exactly how these things work. All right, that's the um, end of um, the webcast as far as I'm concerned. Are there any questions that have come through? Um, I haven't seen any questions submitted yet. Um, if you do want to submit one, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to take them, give you any answers, all that sort of stuff. Um, I'll give it a couple of minutes. Uh, Otherwise, if you don't have any questions, then we'll uh, end the webcast there. Hi there, um, I've just had a question about the slides being available. Um, this webcast will be made available. Um, I will have a check and see if we can get the slides out, but I don't see any reason why not. Um, leave that one with me. Um, I think uh, there's a recording here, so you should be able to get hold of them already from there. Okay, so um, final point from me, and, uh, I, I can't see any more questions coming through at the moment, but feel free. So just while we've got a couple of minutes left here, I think one of the questions that came up on a previous webcast, which I think is quite pertinent and probably should be something that we should all be aware of, I mentioned it previously, and um, one of the, in fact I mentioned it multiple times previously, but one of the key things around dealing with a breach is that there are... Um, a whole bunch of um, 
sorry, I do apologize. So um, one of the things that came up previously was that a lot of this is process can be done before a breach takes place. And a lot of these processes um, should be documented already. I think a lot of what tends to happen is the processes are um, documented but never implemented. So someone somewhere wrote them, went, great, yeah, and then everyone got on with running the business. So putting this sort of thing um, within a process and actually acting upon it, way in, you know, forget about the breach thing, is only going to help. And it's not going to just help with preventing a breach. It will help with the overall security level, the risk ratings will be reduced, and all sorts of other things. If you can get these embedded into things like business continuity and disaster recovery, even better. Okay, so um, someone's asked if the verbal notes were great. Are these captured anywhere? Um, I don't know whether they are is the, is the um, answer to that one, I'm afraid. So um, let me check. Um, we'll get some stuff out. Um, the notes on the slides, I think, are out there. Um, as I say, the recording is about... Um, so this will be recorded and you can replay it. Um, so if you want you know, to go and grab stuff that I've said outside of the slide where, then feel free to uh, do so. All right. Well, well look, we're at, um, we've got like four minutes to spare. So let's close that down there um, if there's anything else. Um, if you want to rate this, then please do so. It would be much appreciated. Um, if you have any other questions, as I say, my... Um, uh, details and my email address are there. I'm more than happy to have you know, people corresponding with me. If I don't know the answers, I can always get back to you. I can get other people to do so. Um, thank you very much for your time today. And um, please come along, visit our website, have fun, um, and uh, yeah, good luck out there, guys. Many thanks.